to continue, um, the OFC, um, you were there just before the Troubles, really, I suppose, 66, um, but you yes. went on and did your PhD there, or? I, yes, I did. I went from there to, I got the Lund Corner Fellowship, I went to, I think I got the years wrong, by the way, it's 63 to 65 I was there, yeah. and then got the fellowship and spent a year in you Corner. your glasses off and... <laughs> for continuity. <laughs> right. Sorry, a year in Cornell University learning mm. Taiwanese. Because mm. I'd thought of possibly doing field work. I knew I wanted to do it on religion. Mm. And um, I had already read a great deal about Chinese religion in English and French and written a dissertation on feng shui, which mm. eventually got published. But the, um, and I wanted to go on and do field work on religion. Knew I couldn't do it in the mainland, thought of doing it in Penang, um, and then decided that actually you know, Taiwan was the best place to do it. And so I had to learn Taiwanese and went to Cornell to do that. And there I got uh, very interested in phenomenological anthropology and in linguistic anthropology, there was a man called Charles Hockett teaching there, who knew some Chinese. But um, uh, the main point of being there wasn't the anthropology, it was to learn Taiwanese. With, again, a fairly large cohort of students, the, the largest that I think there ever was to learn Taiwanese. Mm. Um, and we all went to do field work, mainly anthropologists, but a couple of sociologists as well, in Taiwan in 66. Hmm. And uh, um, I had to come back for my father's funeral and then went on to Taiwan. And uh, um, spent a year and a half in Taiwan doing field work on religious change, was the topic. Can and you remember your first arrival? I do, yeah. Um, I gone there under the auspices, you had to have a sponsor, of the Joint Commission for Rural Reconstruction, which is an extremely odd um, institution of state, joint between the US and Taiwan, or the Republic of China, as it's formally called. And the, but it was uh, for basically agrarian extension uh, and uh, development. It was a development agency at the most senior level of government, equivalent to a ministry. And they sponsored, I think all of us, I'm not sure, they certainly sponsored me. Um, and so I went on a trip with the JCCR, somebody arranged it, to find a field site. And there was a strange moment one evening in Puli, which is right in the center of Taiwan, up in the mountains, um, where in the evening they, we were walking down this street and there were all kinds of um, stalls or just laid out on the paving, um, people offering haircuts or whatever it might be. And there was this person who had uh, divination sticks, and he called out to me in Taiwanese, but I could understand it just, only just. Um, your father's just died. And so I thought, that's very uncanny, because he had. <laughs> um, uh, and, but, uh, but then, because I'm very skeptical, I realized this, well, if you can guess a Western person's age, it's likely that someone my age may happen to, I'm already approaching 30. Um, and uh, we didn't stop to, for me to have my fortune told by this person. But that was one uncanny moment. And the other one was where I'd sort of taken the lead in a bunch of us students uh, finding our ways in one of the other places that and I realized that 
although I could ask the way, I found it extremely difficult to understand the answer. <laughs> 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 Nearly got lost. Mm. So I realized that actually my language facility at that point needed much improvement before I could do proper field work. Mm. How long did it take you until you could well, understand I, the answer as well as your question? Um, I guess five months. Mm. But in the meantime, of course, it was growing all that time. And my first five months, I did fairly uh, ordinary, uh, repetitive things. I, I, I did a census of that small town I was in called Shading, mm. and uh, just went round every house and asked them who was living there and all the rest of it. They must have thought it was extremely curious. <laughs> but they knew that there was this strange foreigner living in on an open balcony and just under the roof of the temple uh, with the teachers of the school who had, some of them had quarters in the temple as well. And so they knew about me so. Mm. And I went around um, talking to people about with fairly standard questions that I wanted to know from each other. And by the time that five months was over, I having done that and having been invited into their homes at the time of festivals, there already were a couple while I was in those five months. Um, I think my Taiwanese by that time was pretty, pretty fluent. And at that point my family came to join me, my wife and two children, and uh, moved to Taipei because this is a small town mm. deliberately chosen within reach of Taipei because I wanted to see what people who from the small town, uh, when they had moved to the city, how they changed their ritual habits, if at all, um, and or how they kept their links with Shuri. So we lived in, Tai in Taipei for nine months, and then they left, and I stayed on for another five months, mm. or five, four, six months, living with two Taiwanese friends um, in this one room, and. Having at that point, I really, I had a very distorted vocabulary. I could do every day, but I could do Taoist ritual <laughs> vocabulary better than most ordinary Taiwanese could. Um, and and I was studying Taoists at that point, the Taoists in, in, a, in a certain temple. Um, and and what I was interested in was the links between the the, the linkages between temples and between people, between households through the, a set of, in that case, Buddhist lay Buddhist brothers who did all the funerals in Shading and in the area around. And the Taoists did all the Jiao, the, the, um, the big uh, refurbishment ceremonies for reopening of, of temples in, that, in a much bigger region of that part of Taiwan. And I went with them to the various places they did that. Not so many places, just three, but, um, mm. but they're big, big ceremonies. And um, so, yeah, that was my fieldwork, which I thoroughly enjoyed. You I did? Really loved it. And you went field. lonely or? Sorry? You went lonely or sick or? Anything? No, I was, I, I was never sick, although my American friends there kept on going to the, what's it called? The US Forces place, the equivalent of the British NAFI. Mm. Um, they kept going there to buy their food and stuff like that. And I, mm. I was living on street stalls. But mm. For some reason, possibly because I'd lived such a war baby childhood, that mm. I, I didn't suffer from it. Mm. Um, uh, I felt lonely, that's for sure, mm. in the first five months. Um, I was, I felt slightly persecuted by the children, with whom, of course, were the first people I got on with. Okay? Yeah. My level of language was more like theirs, as mm. well. but the the children were. Um, there was one particular child with who I, I I I really liked, but he was a, a leader of these between five and eight year olds in mm. a gang. They just mm. wandered very wildly around this small town, and Tigua was his name, and that means uh, iron ox. Mm. Iron ox was also the name for the these small plows. Mm. Uh, tractors that pulled plows, uh, and and he was he was a really burly little fellow, and and uh, I used to.
borrow the space that a teacher lived in, uh, who was who, who who liked me to help him with his English. He wanted to learn English, um, and he would allow me to be in his room where I would put my typewriter to type out my notes. And while I was there, the children would come outside and sort of uh, shout through the crack in the door, "Dabina," uh, uh, which means big nose. He got on. American, I said, I'm not a, an American, I'm an Englishman. Um, but, but they would, in that way, sort of persecute me. In that mm. way. And I felt, I felt, you know, it's a city being persecuted by children. But I did feel slightly mm. persecuted. Yeah. Mm. What was it like having a wife and your own children there? That was good idea. A great it. idea, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, poor Miranda felt very isolated. She didn't speak any Chinese and she didn't have anything to do. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, and we, both our children, well, one, the younger of the two children at the time, we had another one subsequently, mm. but the, the Anna, the youngest, was at home all day, Cordelia I, I take, took to school, um, but not that it was an, English, an American school, because um, she'd already been to an American school in Cornell. Um, and so Miranda was stuck at home, and one of my best older informants' daughters came to our house to help her learn Chinese, uh, which she did. Really. And that was some. But what she loved, and which was great for me too, was to come to the funerals and festivals that I mm. had to go to. Mm. And people just thought I was human when mm. they saw that Miranda there and, uh, and, and our children came too. Mm. Mm. What did you find out and what was the conclusion of this? Well, what I wanted to find out was how religion changed. But it was a, it was a, a dilemma that I think everybody must have when they're coming to something new as new as this was to me. But first of all, I had to understand what was not changing before I could understand what was changing. And that's a, you know, how, how can I do that at the same time? And um, so I think what I learned was through the kind of, a kind of intensive version of what I'd already been doing at school sermons, um, <laughs> of observing a huge amount, writing an enormous number of notes and trying to think, how does this make sense? What kind of sense does it make? And what is being repeated here that was done the previous year or whatever? Because I, I stayed for a whole annual mm -hmm. cycle, of course. And, um, and, and Basically, I was still pretty levi Strossian, so I wanted to find out what the structure of it all was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think I did achieve that. But what I didn't really achieve was the sense of the change. That came a long time later. Um, and, uh, and I think what I achieved then was what I eventually published as uh, the book, Imperial Metaphor which is, came out in the second edition of Popular Religion in China, was a sense of territorial cults and territoriality as such, as a ritually defined thing, um, as being, as having certain ritual elements that you could find with variations of what those elements might be, that you could still you could find, you know, the, 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 I think what I was able to detect were certain kind of procession festivals as being true of the whole of China, the whole of the rest of China, not just Taiwan. And of course, against that, I was accused of being, uh, you know, treating Taiwan as being Chinese, yeah. and, uh, when it wasn't because it's just Taiwanese, or even though I used Taiwanese transliterations in Taiwanese, I mean, of Taiwanese. So I was accused of that by the by two um, 
people who accused all of us, all of us who are doing anthropology in China and Taiwan of doing the anthropology of China and Taiwan, mm -hmm. which is, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a justified accusation. Mm -hmm. I it's made against um, Friedman as well, wasn't it? Well, Morris didn't ever do field work in Taiwan, but, but the, in the new territories, but, yeah. but, but, but in the new territories, uh, it's, it's true, but Morris never claimed Hmm. to be doing more than the more than the anthropology of the two provinces, hmm. Guangdong and Fujian. Hmm. He then wrote things about uh, an old state, hmm. meaning the whole of China, but that's just its, its politics. Hmm. He never claimed to generalize about the lineages of the whole of China. Hmm. And I keep telling people this, and it, hmm. that they, you know, they've set up a straw freedman. Hmm. So you came back from this to write up at the LSE with, yes. with Morris. I did with Morris, but I'd, uh, in, in order partially to save fees, hmm. um, I was, uh, but also because I, I was in a generation that was, it was like a golden age. I was offered two jobs while I was still, still doing field work in Taiwan. <laughs> um, uh, one was to become a lecturer in. Uh, what was it called, Asian Anthropology, in, at SOAS. And the other was from Arthur Wolfe to take up a full fellowship at uh, Cornell, where he was in those days. Um, instead, I did take a small full grant, two small full grants. One was to organize for him a fieldwork seminar of every one of us who was doing fieldwork in Taiwan and Hong Kong, in Taiwan. And the other was for Bill Skinner, from Bill, um, to do work for um, library research in Taiwan and then in uh, Tokyo and in uh, at the Library of Congress on gazetteers on, on uh, ritual and ritual institutions in cities. Of, uh, two cities were Taipei and Ningbo. Mm. Um, uh, which I then were my earliest publications for Bill Skinner's city books. Um, and didn't take the job. I was wondering if you were tempted by either of those jobs. I was. I took mm. the one in Sellers. You did? Yeah. Um, so partly the reason this was an explanation of why I, I was... I was... I, I, I took... I, Morris was... gave me, as it were, free tuition because I was at that point registered just with the University of London, mm -hmm. not with the LSE. And his supervision was pretty minimal at the time. It was just, I would send him chapters, he would correct the grammar, that was it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was already trying to teach anthropology at Sarah's while I was writing. Mm -hmm. um, so... I, uh, this was about 67, 68. This is six, I came back in 68, mm. of all years to come back in. Mm. I remember being in New York at the time of the occupation of Columbia University, mm. and the students sitting on the walls of Columbia University saying, in their incredible insularity, I thought, um, Paris has come out, as it were, for us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I came in. I came back into that, hmm. having uh, basically in, in 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 Taiwan. It dawned on me that I was actually working under a military dictatorship. And hmm. a, a very close friend there was in the army. Then I visited him in his barracks and uh, on the east coast of Taiwan, and realized that uh, his sympathies were probably for Taiwan independence, but he could barely admit it to even me and we shared, you know, we'd been sharing a, a room by that time for five months um, uh, that there were things going on that, I, that people dared speak about in that atmosphere and that politicized me a little bit, just a little bit Did the fact that you were slightly north of Vietnam also politicize you at all? Yes I'd already gone on demonstrations against the war at Cornell hmm. um, at the time, I didn't have a set politics. I was just mm. against that war, um, and and I didn't 
feel more than it was wrong. And so the school we sent our eldest child to was a missionary school, not a military school, living mm -hmm. for Americans. Um, and there were lots of people, lots of GIs doing rest and recreation in Taipei mm -hmm. when we were living there. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't against them. In fact, I became, I had struck up an odd relationship at the time in Taiwan with the naval attaché for the American uh, embassy there uh, because he knew, I don't know how I met him actually, but he knew how to get marijuana. <laughs> and so we would smoke together. It was only on a couple of occasions. Mm. And he was very interested in Buddhism and he taught me how to meditate. He taught me how to meditate. Mm. Um, and then I lost touch with him altogether until one day, many, many years later, a very beautiful book of sutras was sent to me by this person whom I didn't recognize at all. He'd taken a Buddhist name. And then I realized it's him <laughs> uh, from California, right? <laughs> I mean, someone who was also against um, the war in Vietnam and also the politicization of anthropologists was Arthur Wolf, who you mentioned. Um, and an, an important worker on Taiwan. Do you know Arthur well? I do. Mm. So I mean, I knew both Bill and Arthur, but they split in the most awful way. And so I... Well, they split? Well, they split. They became antagonists mm. um, at Stanford. Mm. We put it there. And then Arthur, again, was involved in the splitting of the anthropology department mm. itself at Stanford. Mm. Um, I mean, Bill Skinner moved elsewhere, moved to Davis. Mm. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and Arthur, but I, I, I yes, I, I know both of them. Mm. You, well, Bill Skinner's dead now, but, the, mm. the, but I, 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 I do know Arthur well. And went to, of course, went to all their lectures at mm. Cornell when I was there. So Arthur lectured on psychological anthropology. Mm. I went to them. Um, but Arthur, he may have been against the war, but he's, he's, he's very strictly unpoliticized anthropologist. Didn't, didn't he write that famous article, Anthropologists on the Warpath, which was about the secret funding of the CIA? In uh, Thailand? No, that was somebody else. Was it? Yes, yes, that's Eric Wolf. Eric Wolf. Oh, that's right. That's right. No, Arthur, Arthur wasn't like that. Um, mm. And uh, um, and Arthur, but but uh, Arthur's work on on religion, mm. uh, although I didn't agree with it, was a really pioneering pioneering work mm. on God's ghosts and scholars, uh, mm. God's ghosts and ancestors, mm. um, and uh, and I was there when he gave it as a paper, and mm. you know, was very influenced. And what about Marjorie? Wolf? Yeah, well, Marjorie was. Uh, firstly, they, you know, I went to their to their field site uh, mm. um, after they'd left, and um, and that was where one of these big jiao were mm. that's in, in Shulin, mm. um that I went to see, and and I was introduced there, as it were, through them, mm. um, and. And Marjorie's book, The House of Lin, the mm. first of her books, uh, which came out while I was at SOAS, I think, um, mm. I think is a wonderful book, a, a really great book of, of, mm. of in depth and very, um, I don't know, familiar, making every, making the Chinese family familiar. But, but, uh, but before that, I, though I never became interested to, for myself to do research, I thought that their work on, on childhood was extremely good, very, very interesting. And, you know, that Arthur's, I think it was mainly Arthur, but it must have been Marjorie too, on how I then saw my own childhood, as mm -hmm. it were, as on that transition to when the father begins to stop being, treating their ch child as a, especially their son, as, as someone to indulge. And then has to start 
teaching them to be, as it were, a son. Mm. Um, that moment is a very, very stark moment in, in Taiwan. Mm. And they described it extremely well. Mm. Mm. Coming back to Soas, you seem always to be about two years ahead of me. Um, I went to Soas actually in 68, but um, I was just a you know, PhD student starting off there. But you were there with me, again, at the end of a great generation of well, I took, anthropologists. I took Mendelssohn's place. Mm. Um, and he was somebody I sort of admired. I thought he, his, his writings or expositions of Lady Strauss were fantastically good, and, mm. and the way in which he wanted to work poetry into his anthropology was, mm. I thought, thoroughly worth attempting to emulate, but I never mm. did. Mm. Um, and uh, But his course that he taught mm. became the course that I taught, and it was my best teaching experience. He, he, it was basically a reading group. It was advanced theory, um, and he he'd chosen these classics, which I varied only a little bit. It's just a series of classic anthropo anthropological texts that everybody had to, to read, plus all the rereadings and redoings of the anthropology of those classics. Um, each each week, a new one. And I thought it was the most wonderful way of teaching theory. So I did it. I did exactly the same as he did it. And he was, so that was an influence of somebody I never met and who wasn't yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> but the person, of course, that became my bugbear was, was, was Christoph von Thürer Heimdorf. Mm -hmm. um, but the people there that I, uh, Barbara Ward became a sort of auntie figure for me. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Abner Cohen mm -hmm. was was a, was a I, I, you know I mean he he had his rather over rigidly dualistic theory mm -hmm. of everything, um, but it was very you know really exciting to see him working it out and just be at seminars with him. Mm -hmm. um, Adrian Ma and Adrian Ma yes. Mm -hmm. So I I mean being at being being at SOAS much more than being uh, an undergrad, uh, sorry, postgraduate at the NSE, meant not just learning, well, first of all, it meant learning about India, and I didn't know anything about India before mm. that. Um, and, 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 and von Führer Heimdorf was one of those who, as it were, doing that here in Adrian. Uh, mm. um, but uh, the way in which he ran his semi the, se the seminars mm. seemed to me to be so inferior to the way that Raymond had. Mm. Um, I mean, he just didn't have either the intellect for it or, or the energy for it. I don't know. He always went to sleep. Yes, I remember. <laughs> but apart from that, why was he your, your bugbear apart from... Because I was a troublemaker mm. and he was on the side of the director. He was an acting director at some point, wasn't he? No, um, he may have been a something senior, mm. but he no, it was it was Phillips as the director all yes. the way through. He time. acted, I think, yeah, when he was away or something. Right, but, but um, it was you're not wearing ties and going to the restaurant without. Yes, and Barbara Barbara told me to go to the senior common room more often and to wear jackets mm. and ties. Uh, and uh, and I thought yes, that's that's fine. Um, and I, but I should distance myself from the students. Christophe told me I should. Do. She she agreed with him because um, I'd written something mm. on so as school of imperialism. It was cool. um, <laughs> <laughs> with an undergraduate and a postgraduate mm. and a young this this silly young lecturer, in which was not a well-researched piece of work. And, mm. uh, there were factual mistakes in it, mm. which I then had to apologize for. Mm. You know, these are factual mistakes, and I had to put that out as another mm. publication. Uh, but anyway, I was a troublemaker, and as soon as that came out, I think Phillips was overheard to say at some meeting I wasn't at, that, uh, that this man has to go. Mm. And Christoph von Thürer Heimdorf was part of that, mm. to me, to go. 
Um, and uh, the, the only funny story, though it wasn't that funny at the time, was that when I was made to go, the reason for which I went was that I was just not given tenure. Mm. Right, I'd, I'd mm. had five years probation and wasn't. Mm. My contract wasn't renewed. He said, I'll write you a very good reference. There's a very good job going for in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> <laughs> With a one-way ticket. <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> so I thought, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I got a job at the City University and I mm. became a sociologist. Mm. It was about that time that another person I've interviewed, David Seven, oh, yes. also, also um, he and I tried to start a magazine as well. And David uh, fell out with Christoph as well. He did indeed at the same time. Yeah. Uh, went off to UEA. To UEA, where he still is. Still, still yes. is. Yes, I just interviewed him recently. Um, so I was obviously a conformist or something. Um, I had <laughs> Indian blood in me. Um, we got on okay, but he was getting towards the end of his... Yes, he was. Um, and he'd set up the whole department about 20 years earlier, and it was his last years. Right. And Piers Videbsky was there as well. Um, was he? I didn't know that. I wish I'd known that, because mm. I only met him later. Mm. No, mm. Piers was there just... I think Piers and I had fight over whether we were Christoph's last student together, so I see. it must have been about the same time. Mm. Um, so, the next move was to the City University. Um, yes, but I kept on in doing research on China, mm. and I kept on being an anthropologist. I taught a historical introduction to anthropology there. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I missed being in an anthropological context mm. very much. Um, but I did become very interested as I had already at SOAS, in the whole relationship between racism in the UK and the history of imperialism in the British imperialism. And that, by that time, while I was at SOAS, I had already written what is my first anthropological publication, which was in Talal Assad's uh, Anthropology in the Colonial Encounter. Mm. Um, and I'd done some research at the RAI and various other places on the relationship between indirect rule and the wish of anthropologists to be serving uh, in ways that I realized were thoroughly ambivalent, both being of use to a colonial regime, but also critical of it. Mm. And um, so that was... So I, I try to set, as it were, anthropology into a rather broadly defined ideological and political context uh, there, and got into bad odour with a lot of anthropologists for that, but mm. obviously not with Talal. Um, in fact, Talal had already been organising another a set of seminars, that, uh, th and I was organising some seminars on imperialism and anthropology, just informal. Mm. And we put the two together into this book, we all the best of them. And, but he was the main editor. Mm. So at the City University, I took over a course on the sociology of race, which I turned into my own uh, syllabus for it. I didn't do the same as, it, as I inherited, as I had done when I went to SARS. Um, and that became a major interest. I, I didn't do field works, uh, but I did pretty intense uh, work on such on the police, for instance, on police racism, and what was then and still is called canteen culture uh, in the metropolitan police, in particular. And there's an extraordinary number of policemen who became anthropologists who did field work, as it were, on their police work. Mm. Um, and they're really very, very interesting. Um, and uh, published a number of, edited a number of books in which I wrote chapters on, on racism and anti-racism. And just to go back one step, looking back on that imperialism, colonialism and anthropology, mm. 
view that you had then and tell al Assad and that what famous volume. I mean, do you think that uh, most of what you said at the time still holds, or was it overdrawn to, as a reaction? Or no, I think people thought it was over more drawn than it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I read back at it, which mm -hmm. I do still agree with it, yes. Mm -hmm. um, because I think I was conscious of the fact that it was ambivalent. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something about... Uh, people are still doing the same sort of thing. Alan Chan, for instance, mm -hmm. writes pretty similar things about Hong Kong anthropology mm -hmm. as I was doing more generally about African, mm -hmm. um, mainly African. Um, but I also brought Papua New Guinea into it for some reason. I can't I remember what I was doing that before. Maybe that was another, pub another attempted publication, which I didn't do. Um, but the. I don't think it was wrong. I think there are points at which the conclusions became too strident. Um, but my main argument was to look at what it might have been possible to write at the time of the writing. Mm. Not to say it should have been, and then sort of reading back into it something from later. Mm. So I wanted to look at you know, what might it have been possible to write in Africa, about, about Africa, at the time that, uh, of, that Fortis was writing about the mm. Tenensi. Um, and my main criticism was it could have been a damn sight more historical. Mm -hmm. um, so why was it so unhistorical? I then tried to figure out, you know, why was it? Um, but I also wanted to 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 think about, you know, how why did Malinowski refer to upstart natives? Mm -hmm. That's a quote. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what was what was it that could allow an anthropologist to say, to write that? Mm. That's, that's what I was trying to well, do. His, his diary had just come out in 67, and reading that, which was a terrible shock to me, the racist, mm. obvious racism in the diary, right. and arrogance and patronizing attitudes in general, mm. um, was appalling. I mean, I didn't expect that at all. So, uh, I mean, this is also, I mean, the, Evans Pritchard also is accused of you know, basically leaving out things. Not, not nothing that he put in was wrong. But no, no, but leaving out things so that what's put in the... I mean, it's all there. It's actually in the preface, mm -hmm. the, the fact that the Noah got strafed. Mm -hmm. um, but why isn't that a significant ethnographic fact? Mm -hmm. because, because... And then I found myself doing it when I went to Taiwan because actually it's very difficult to do history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you. I mean, it's not for you, mm. but it's. But but, uh, I mean, it may not be for you. But to it, to be able to say, these are the institutions that have changed, mm. and that are themselves the result of change. I find it's a really challenging thing to do, mm. and it's what I now want to do on a huge time scale. But, mm. um, using the concept of civilization, mm. but the the uh, but. Uh, time I found it really difficult and now I can sympathize with it which I couldn't at the time mm. that much I admit to I didn't sympathize with it mm. that's what I was wondering maybe right. you understand it as well mm. as criticizing it um, well that last thing you talked about sounded rather exciting what was this large well I be, because I do have done so much with Wang Ming Ming well, let, talk, tell me about Wang Yingming, because right. I have an interview about him. Yes, I'd like to talk about Wang Yingming. Mm. Wang Yingming uh, was in London doing his PhD at SOAS. Mm. Um, on some of his books in Chinese, I believe he calls me his, his, his supervisor, which I wasn't. Mm. But, but, but in a way, it's a sort of a Chinese mm. way of speaking about somebody senior, mm. um, senior to them. And, but I met him through, as he rightly said in his interview, mm. the London China Seminar, which I was organizing while I was at City University, mm. but which held its meetings in SOAS. And the, and I realized that this extraordinary student was doing something 
so close to what I myself had done. You know, he was interested in festivals. Mm. Nobody else was. Mm. Um, and what's more, they were in Changzhou, which is where the people that I'd studied came from. Um, so we had big mutual interest, and I was very excited about that. And the the um, I mean the way in which he was doing it was very much influenced by people that I didn't have that much time for uh, at Sowets, but um, it's it's sort of very post structuralist, and I'd already read most of what they'd read and didn't mm. and was using them in different ways. And the, the, uh, but and and he was also looking at things that I didn't know and couldn't know anything about, which was the the relationship between the revived local festivals of of Chuanzhou's neighbourhoods um, and the official festivals, the as it were state regions of the PRC. Um, but in any case. Uh, I was interested in his work, interested in the paper he gave, and then when I got a big grant from the ESRC to do, a, I knew I couldn't do studies of religion even then, in the late 80s, early 90s, I got a grant to do mutual support systems, mm. which I knew I would, when I went to visit the field sites myself, it was all done by Chinese colleagues, and one of them was Wang Ming Ming, when I went to to actually see his field site, we, we could do some religion study, which we did in Meifa, the village, uh, and Kandong as well, but the in um, Meifa. And to cut a long story short, this is a, a, this was therefore a relationship that's now uh, twenty years old. Um, he has enabled me to rejuvenate my Chinese anthropology. I have to say, I really, I know he's very, you know, I know that I can contribute something to him, but he's contributed an enormous amount to me um, through doing joint field work, mainly. But he does more of it than I do. I mean, I come in the short visits, he's there for much longer. And then since then, just by constantly being invited by him to come and in a senior capacity to be commenting on students' work and stuff like that. Um, and um, but through that influence to cut this to, to come back round to the point that you were asking mm -hmm. about, I you can't be with Wang Wing Wing for very long without becoming more and more historically conscious. And uh, and it was embarrassing when he went and did field work in Shading for another joint project that we did that he got the money for. Um, well, we jointly did, but it was his idea initially, which came out as the book Grassroots Charisma, um, in which he did field work in my original field work place and and to Mayfair where we'd both been before for this other mutual support study. Um, it was a comparison of similar religious culture but completely different regimes, um, political regimes and economies. He, he immediately, within two months, he'd found out more about the history of Shading than, than uh, I knew was even there, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, and, and I thought, oh, it's not just linguistic. I mean, it is largely that too. Mm. It's 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 an immediate instinct he has for for for, for looking for genealogies for whatever it might be, hmm. um, and he did the same thing on a, on on the mutual support study. I mean, his first thing was not actually to look at mutual support. He did the questionnaire. That's all I asked him to do. But he, what he did immediately was to find out the history of Mefa. Hmm. So, and then and 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 so what does he talk about? He talks about Chinese civilization. What is that? You know, how do we, as anthropologists, think about that? And now I'm really involved in it as a as a concept. I want to, and I began working with Mike Rowlands uh, at UCL, who is an Africanist and 
a Mediterranean uh, to some extent. Um, the, and we are working on, we've now given a number of lectures on uh, one wing invitation in Beijing. And I'm going to give a similar one, uh, uh, the most worked out one, for China, uh, on the concept of civilization and Chinese civilization at Fudan University in two weeks' time. And the, it's, it's looking at the, the really long term of material culture mainly, but, but for me, I'm, I always want to go beyond the material culture. Uh, compared to Mike, who's trained as an archaeologist as well as an anthropologist. And Wang Ling Ming was trained as an archaeologist as well mm. as an anthropologist. Mm. So, um, we're reviving the concept of civilization developed by Mus, Marcel mm. Mus. And, uh, and trying to rethink all that was done by diffusionism and ethnology. But then, um, but without any ethnocentrism, and without a, a universal evolutionist perspective. So, um, the challenge is to be able to see continuity and radical transformation all at the same time. What is it that continues? How is does it become a vehicle for change, um, or for learning new things? And, and, and all this over periods of change that can last hundreds of years. That's, that's mm. the project, mm. a comparative civilizations project. Mm. Fascinating. Uh, so many things to talk about, but mm. so little time, as I say. Um, I mean, looking at China in this long time span, mm. uh, some people think that the Maoist period was, like many other sort of small blips. Exactly. And that there, there's much that is yes. continuous underneath. Yes, yes. I'm so, you, you're absolutely right to ask the question. I ask it for myself. And I gave a lecture at the LSE, the public lecture, hmm. uh, a few weeks ago on precisely this question. Hmm. It's in a series called After 30 Years of Reform. Hmm. And I realized that Maoism was actually, as a state, less than 30 years. So I was asking myself, hmm. is Maoism just and doing it as it were in public. And no, the answer to, uh, because Mao's, Maoism was so extraordinary, he likened himself to Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor. Mm -hmm. And Qin Shi Huangdi was only 25 years as well, mm -hmm. but had an enormous influence. Now, I don't think Mao was going to have that kind of influence. He thought he was going to be far superior to Qin Shi Huangdi. They actually mm -hmm. said, you know, trouble with Qin Shi Huangdi was, he was just an emperor, mm. whereas I have the people on my side, and therefore my, my, uh, you know, what we did is going to be much more lasting than what Qin Shi Huangdi did. Um, not true, in my opinion, but nevertheless, the state that he established in China, which is still the current state, although it's not mm. Maoist any longer, there are certain institutions, like the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party itself, like uh, certain ways of, of working as, as a political organization with work teams that, mm. that, that, um, that make investigations or implement policy. Um, and when they make their investigations, it becomes policy later on. That sort of the mechanics of what Mao called the mass line are still going on, you know, through 30 years of reform. So I don't think it is just a blip. Mm. There's, there are many other reasons, but there's... I mean, if you believe that there's a deep continuity over, say, to a couple of thousand years in Chinese history, mm. and then you get Manchus and, and Mongolians and so on and so on, mm. dis disturbing it for 50, 100 years, and yeah. then it goes... Do you think um, that deep continuity has been broken, in other words? Often. But, but now, but, with but the Maoist... The, I mean, the Maoist break was, the, was probably the biggest, but... There have been so many breaks mm. f during the Republican era before mm. that. I mean, the extent of destruction was probably greatest in the Cultural Revolution, but the, under the Kuomintang, there was immense um, zeal to, mm. to destroy temples, to turn them mm. into schools and all the rest of it. So there, there, there have been periods of iconoclasm in, mm. before that in China, mm. as you know. And, and, um, 
But there are certain things that seem to me to be continuous, although their, uh, the, their, their content may have changed. Something of them remains. So, for instance, my shortest definition of Chinese civilization is, as I think I told you in mm. Chinese, um, is, 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 is sage rule and self-cultivation. Mm. And I think that still goes on. Mm. Um, Mao and Chiang Kai-shek were, as it were, rivals for being the sage who ruled China. It's, I mean, it's trite to say it just like that, but the, 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 the notion of a moral leadership is quite peculiar to China. I don't think it's true of every other mm. civilization. And the notion of self-cultivation through bodily techniques or feng shui or whatever, um, and the cosmology that goes with it of balance, is still true. It's true in Qigong. It's, and it was true through different techniques all the way back from the time of Zhuangzi. Well, we're just coming to the end of our second tape, but I wondered if there was anything that you would like me to have asked you and talk to about a bit, a little bit. Mm. Um, your family, your wife, your children, your home life, your future plans, whatever. Yeah, uh, I, I think yes, I do want to trace through my life one further thing. My interest in place and on spatial formation, mm -hmm. to which I've now added the idea that one, could, one ought to be able to look at different senses of place. I wrote, uh, I, I, I wrote the introduction, a theoretical introduction, plus one chapter to a book called Making Place, about Chinese ways of making place. Um, is an extension of my interest in feng shui, in which um, I now want to add not only to the fact that different people have different senses of the same place, which they each center for themselves, but which they have joint sense of centeredness, is also a different senses of time about that, and different senses of the histories that run into it. Um, and I want to be able to develop that in the future. And I'm writing something now um, for a, the, next, the second in a series of seven workshops that Laura Baer at the uh, LSE and I are basically the organizers of. On, it's called Conflicts in Time. But it's also about different senses of time, which I'm calling temporalities. Um, and that project is, uh, is another ongoing one, not just for civilization one. And I'm currently writing a for this workshop, which is to occur at the end of the next week uh, in Edinburgh, a joint paper with Luo Pan, if you remember her from, from Chuanzhou, mm. who did work with the Municipal Planning Bureau in Chuanzhou on planning in Chuanzhou. It's, mm. you know, a plan is never achieved, and what it has to get mixed up with is what's so interesting. And mm. it includes different people's senses of the place they're in and their history and their sense of future as well. Well, mentioning the future is a, a nice point to end. I hope this conversation will continue next time, perhaps in China. Who knows? Yes, I hope so too, yes. Thank I'm you sure. very much indeed. Thank so you, Alan. Um,